I live in a small town near Philly. My life is pretty simple. I have a job that doesn't pay much, so I buy most of my stuff from thrift stores or Craigslist. Last year, my phone broke into pieces. It was a big problem because I couldn't afford a new one. So I decided to look for a used one on Craigslist. I found an old iPhone that had some scratches, but it was better than my broken one. We decided to meet at 8 p.m. near the local police station. I always try to be safe. The deal went smoothly. I gave the guy cash, and he gave me the phone. It was easy. When I got home and put my SIM card into the phone, strange things started happening. I got weird texts asking for money in a special type called crypto. They said things like the job is done. I blocked the numbers, but more kept coming, one after the other. Then I got a really scary message. It talked about a mom and her kids being hurt and tied up. I was really scared and didn't know what to do. I tried to contact the person who sold me the phone, but they had disappeared. I went to the police and showed them everything. They took my phone and said it might be connected to something really bad, like people being taken and sold. It was terrifying. Why would someone sell me a phone involved in something like that? Days went by, but I didn't hear much from the cops. They told me some things, but it didn't make me feel better. People who did bad things might still be out there, and I'm worried about that mom and her kids. I don't even know if they're safe. Now, I feel like someone is following me. There's this red truck that I see whenever I go out, and it makes me really scared. Also, I found a mark on my car, a W with a cross. It's the same mark that was on that mom's car. I'm terrified. I have guns and a dog at home, but it doesn't feel like enough to keep me safe. I'm never using Craigslist again. Who knows what kind of trouble it could bring. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, they did. One night, as I was going home from work, I saw the red truck following me again. I tried to lose it by taking different ways and driving faster, but it stayed right behind me. Finally, I reached my house, feeling scared. The red truck stopped across the street, its bright lights shining through the dark. I got out of my car quickly, searching for my keys, and hurried inside, locking the door. I peeked through the curtains, watching as the red truck waited for a moment before driving away slowly. My hands were shaking as I wanted to call the police, but I remembered they still had my phone for investigation. I felt really scared and lost. I sat down on the sofa, feeling like I couldn't do anything. I kept thinking about why those people were chasing me, but I didn't have any answers. I just had a lot of questions in my head. The next day, I decided to do something about it. I asked my friend if I could use their phone and call the police. I wanted to know what they were doing about my situation. After waiting for what felt like a really long time, a detective finally answered. He seemed surprised that I called and said they were working on it. But when I asked for more details, he didn't want to say much. He talked about ongoing investigations and told me to wait patiently. I was really mad and upset. I slammed down the phone and felt really lonely. It seemed like nobody cared about what I was going through, like they thought I was too young to understand. But I wasn't going to give up. I decided to do some investigating on my own. I remembered I had one clue left, the phone. So I called my friend who knows a lot about technology and asked if he could help me find out where the messages were coming from. At first he wasn't sure, but then he got interested in the mystery. We worked together for hours, looking at the phone's information and following clues online to figure out who was sending the messages. We found something hidden deep in the phone. It was a secret folder with lots of coded files. We tried to decode them, and then we understood something scary. These weren't just random messages. They were commands to do terrible things. And somehow, they were linked to me. I felt really sick when I realized what was happening. I had accidentally gotten involved in something very bad and now, I didn't know what to do. But now, I couldn't turn back. I had to help that poor mom and her kids, and also keep myself safe. I promised myself I'd find out what was going on no matter what. As I kept looking into things, I found out it was more complicated than I thought. It wasn't just about the red truck and strange marks on my car. There were other people involved, shady ones who were hiding in the shadows. 
The closer I got to the truth, the more dangerous it got. I barely escaped a few times, facing really scary situations. It felt like being in a scary movie, but scarier because it was real life, and there was a lot at stake. Even when things were really tough, I didn't give up. I was determined to make sure the bad people got punished, no matter what. And as I kept looking for clues, I got closer to the truth. Finally, after searching for a long time, I found out who was behind everything, a powerful person with connections to crime. It was a big shock that made everyone feel scared and unsure. But in the end, the bad person was caught, and their group was stopped for good. It was a win. But it was sad too because some people got hurt along the way. For me, going through a tough time made me stronger and smarter. I faced my fears and won. This shows how bravery and not giving up can help when things are hard. Even though I still remember the tough times, I won't let them control me. I know that no matter what comes my way, I'll handle it with the same strength and toughness that got me through the hardest times. My name is Mark, and I'm 29 years old, and I have three kids. Let me tell you about something that happened to me in the summer of 2017 that caused me a lot of stress. It began when I chose to rent out my gray Ram pickup truck. It wasn't very old, just a few years. I had to make a tough decision that I didn't really want to make. I was working a lot, and my wife got sick. She lost her job, which made it hard for us to pay for things. Even though I worked more hours, we still didn't have enough money. We had a lot of debt from credit cards and loans. Then my cousin suggested something. He said I could rent out my truck on Craigslist to make extra money. People could use it for jobs like fixing things around the house, and I could earn up to $100 a day. It was a bit of a strange idea, but we were desperate for money, so I decided to try it. I never used Craigslist before. I was nervous about talking to people I didn't know online. But there I was, at home with my cousin, trying to make an account and put up an ad. He really helped me out, showing me what to do. Once we made the account, I took some pictures of the truck and put them in the ad. After a day, my inbox was full of messages from people who wanted to buy the truck. I didn't know who to pick. I felt overwhelmed and called my cousin for help. I felt a bit silly for not being able to decide on my own but he just said to read through the messages and choose someone. So I began reading through the messages, trying to find the right person. It was really hard because they all wanted to rent the truck for similar reasons. Eventually, I just picked someone randomly. The person's name was Mike, or at least that's what it said on his account. He said he needed the truck to move bricks to his friend's construction site. It seemed okay to me, so I said yes to renting it to him. When he came to get the truck, I felt a little worried, but when I saw him, he just looked like any other construction worker. He was tall, had a beard, and his hands were dirty. He seemed like a good guy, so I gave him the keys and he paid me right away. Everything seemed fine for the next four days. I checked my phone to see where the truck was using GPS, just to be sure it was okay. But then, something weird happened. Every night, from 2 to 4 in the morning, a truck would drive back and forth, between two places. It kept coming back by morning. I didn't get why someone would use a truck at such a weird time. I asked my cousin about it, but he said it wasn't our business as long as the truck was okay when it came back. So, I stopped worrying and focused on my own stuff. After four days, I thought Mike would bring back the truck like he said he would, but he didn't come. I waited a long time, feeling more worried. Then I checked the GPS to see where the truck was. It was far away, near a big park. I got scared and called my cousin. He came quickly, and we went to the park to find the truck. When we got there, the truck looked okay on the outside. But when I opened the glove box, I saw something really scary, a finger with blood on it. It made me feel really sick, so I called the police right away. Police checked everything carefully and found out that the truck belonged to Mike. They discovered he was using it to move parts of his ex-wife's body. He had killed her and buried her in the national park. That scary experience really hurt me. I didn't think something bad would happen when I let someone borrow my truck. 
It made me understand how risky it is to trust people you don't know, especially online. So, I promised myself I'll never let anyone borrow my truck or anything else again. When I learned I was going to have a baby, I felt really happy. My boyfriend, Mark, and I had been trying for some time. And finally, it happened. I used to live in my hometown in West Virginia, but Mark was from Oregon. So, we decided to move there together to raise our baby. It was June 2023, and I was eight months pregnant with a baby boy. We were going to call him Tyler. I felt excited and hopeful about the future. I wanted everything to be perfect for Tyler's arrival, so I was busy getting everything ready. My friend told me I could find cheap baby clothes on a website called Craigslist. So, I started looking there and found a lot of stuff. Then, I saw this lady, Sarah, who was also looking for baby clothes. We started chatting, and it turned out we both had some clothes we didn't need anymore. I met Sarah to swap clothes because we're both going to be moms. I felt nervous but also happy to meet her. I drove to her house in Washington County, Oregon, hoping we could become friends and help each other out during this exciting but crazy time. When I arrived, we chatted and laughed in her driveway. But when we went inside her house, things got scary. Suddenly, Sarah attacked me with a metal stick, hitting me until I fell down. It was really frightening. I don't know how long it lasted. She bit me like an animal. She seemed not human anymore. Then, she used a razor blade to cut me. I felt it all but couldn't move, like a scary dream. After she took my baby, she left me. I don't remember getting home. Mark found me and called an ambulance. They took me to the hospital. They said I was lucky to be alive. The police came and took Sarah away because they found my baby in her house. But when they found him, he was already gone. They said Sarah was pretending to be pregnant like me. She really wanted a baby, but she was acting strange and not normal. I can't believe this happened. I thought Sarah would be my friend during this time. Instead, she tried to hurt me and take my baby. It feels like a scary movie. Now Sarah is in jail forever. They say she won't ever come out. But it doesn't change what she did to me and my baby. I will always remember it no matter how much I try to forget. It's like a mark on my heart that will stay forever. But you know what's even crazier? After all that happened, I found out something that really surprised me. Sarah wasn't working alone. There was someone else involved. Someone I never would have guessed. It all began when I received a letter in the mail. At first, I thought it was just a bill or something, but when I opened it, I was shocked. It was from someone who said they were Sarah's sister, Lily. According to the letter, Lily had no clue what her sister was doing until it was too late. She mentioned that Sarah had always been a bit odd, but she never thought she could do something like this. Lily asked for forgiveness and said she wanted to fix things. At first, I was unsure about what to think. I didn't know if I could trust someone who was related to Sarah. But as I read the letter more, I started to believe Lily. She seemed truly sorry for what her sister did and wanted to help me. I decided to meet Lily in person to see if she was telling the truth. We met at a cafe in town, and I could see right away that she was different from Sarah. Lily was kind and caring, nothing like Sarah. Lily told me that Sarah had been acting strangely for months before the attack. She became obsessed with having a baby, even though she wasn't pregnant. Lily tried to talk to her sister about it, but Sarah wouldn't listen. When Lily and I were talking, she told me something really scary. She said, Sarah, someone we know was spending a lot of time with another woman named Emily. Lily thought Emily was encouraging Sarah to do bad things, like planning to hurt me. I was shocked. Emily was a friend of mine for a long time. How could she be a part of something so awful? Lily didn't know why Emily would do this, but she promised to find out. She wanted to make sure Emily faced the consequences for what she did and to make things better for me and Tyler. Lily kept me updated on what she was doing. She hired someone to check into Emily's past, and it turned out Emily had been sick in her mind for a long time. She had been in hospitals because of it. The detective found out something really scary. It turns out that Emily was planning to hurt other pregnant women, 
not just Sarah. They were working together to do bad things. Lily went to the police and told them everything she knew. She wanted Emily to get in trouble for what she did. In the end, Emily got arrested and charged with planning to hurt people. At first, she said she didn't do it, but later she admitted it when there was lots of proof. I felt better when I saw Emily getting taken away by the police. Now, things can start to get better for me, knowing that she won't hurt anyone else. Even though Sarah and Emily were in jail, the hurt they caused will never go away. I'll always remember the terrible things they did. It makes me scared because I know there are bad people out there. As I hug Tyler, I promise to keep him safe. I promised myself too. I'll do anything to shield him from the bad things in life so he doesn't have to feel the pain I felt. With that promise in my heart, I started feeling hopeful about the future again. Even if tough things happen, I believed I could handle them with Tyler's help. We'd face problems together and come out stronger. I was with my boyfriend for almost eight years. We started dating when we were 14. We had good times and bad times, but in 2017, we broke up. The problem was that he worked far away from home a lot. He was gone for days because of his job. He stayed in hotels while he worked. This made me feel really bored and lonely without him. We argued a lot because of it. No, I didn't cheat on him. We just couldn't stop arguing. After we broke up, I felt really lonely. It was like I was all alone on an island where nobody could see or hear me. My parents said it was normal to feel that way after such a long relationship ended, but it didn't make me feel any better. So, I did something I'm not proud of. I tried to find a new boyfriend or some kind of relationship on Craigslist, Tinder, and Facebook. So, there's this website called Craigslist where people can buy and sell stuff, but some guys on there can be really weird. I needed something badly, so I started talking to a few of them. One guy messaged me on Craigslist and his name was Mac. Max was very insistent. He kept asking to meet up, but I was unsure because I'd never tried meeting people online before. Eventually, I agreed to meet him in the park when lots of other people would be there. On the day we were supposed to meet, I was super nervous. But when I met Max in the park, he seemed okay at first. He was shorter than I thought, but not bad looking. We sat on a bench and tried to chat, but it was really awkward because he didn't talk much so I had to do most of the talking. I quickly realized it wasn't going to work with Max. He kept messaging me, saying sorry for being weird and asking for another chance. I felt bad for him, so I said yes to a second date. We went to an Italian restaurant, but it was still awkward like the first time. We hardly talked. Then, Max wanted to go for a walk in the park. I wasn't sure, but I agreed. It was a mistake. When we were alone, he tried to kiss me. I laughed, but he didn't think it was funny. He got mad and started being too forceful. That's when I knew I had to leave. I lied and said my dad was sick and went away quickly. Max followed me for a bit, but then he stopped. I was scared, but I knew I had to leave him. After that, I never heard from him again, and I never used Craigslist to meet people again. Looking back, I realize it was dumb to meet someone from the internet like that. It could have been much worse. But you learn from your mistakes. After dealing with Max, I decided to focus on myself. I spent time on my hobbies and with my friends, but I still wanted to find someone to be with. So when my friend suggested I try online dating again, I was unsure. But eventually, I made a Tinder profile. At first I wasn't sure about using Tinder. People said it's mainly for casual dating, not serious relationships. But I thought, why not give it a try? So, I started looking at people's profiles. Most of the guys I found just wanted something casual, which is okay, but it wasn't what I wanted. Then, one day, I saw a profile that I really liked. The guy, his name was Alex, seemed special. His bio was funny and nice, and his pictures showed him doing things he enjoys, like hiking and traveling. I swiped right, and surprisingly, we matched right away. We started talking and I really liked Alex. He was funny and smart, and he wanted to know more about me. We chatted a lot, sharing stories and jokes. Before I knew it, I started to like him. 
After a few weeks, Alex asked me to go on a date. I was nervous but excited to finally meet him in person. We decided to meet at a nearby coffee shop. When I saw him coming towards me, I knew I was happy with my decision. Our first date was great. We talked and laughed a lot, feeling like we had been friends for a long time. It was like we were in our own world, not paying attention to anything else around us. As time passed, I liked Alex more and more. He was exactly what I wanted in a partner, nice, caring, and helpful. We had lots of fun together, going on adventures and making memories. But then something unexpected happened. Alex told me he got a job offer in another state. He said it was a great opportunity, but it meant he had to move away. I felt really sad. I didn't want to be away from Alex, but I understood he had to follow his dreams. We agreed to try long distance, but I knew it would be tough. We were far apart, and it made our relationship hard. We fought a lot. I really missed him and felt lonely. We decided that being far from each other wasn't good for us, so we broke up. It was sad, but we knew it was right. After that, I had a tough time getting over Alex. He meant a lot to me, and I was scared to start over. But with help from my friends and family, I started to feel better. I got really busy with my work and hobbies, trying to make a good life for myself without being in a relationship. After a while, I started feeling better. Now when I think about my time with Alex, I see it was a good experience. It helped me figure out what I want in a partner and made me a better person. I haven't found my perfect match yet, but I'm happy for the love and memories I had with Alex. Maybe one day, I'll meet someone right for me. But for now, I'm happy focusing on myself and enjoying life's journey. Before I continue to the next story, if you are interested in earning from YouTube without showing your face, or without making videos by yourself using artificial intelligence, like the video that you are watching right now, then I have a special free training for you. Check the first link in the description below to get instant access. Everything feels strange. I'm in my kitchen, sitting at the table, and I lost my job. I don't know what to do next. I've lived in Vegas for a long time, but now I might not have enough money to pay rent in two months. I'm really scared of becoming homeless. I've been trying to find any job I can to make money, but I'm running out of options and money quickly. My friend told me to look for small jobs on Craigslist or Facebook, so I checked for security jobs in Las Vegas. There are lots of clubs there, especially at night. The pay was good, but living costs were high. I saw an ad for a club that paid well and had a height requirement which seemed strange, but since I'm tall and heavy, I thought it might be good for me. I contacted the manager, Danny, and he replied quickly, asking if I could start that night. He told me to wear all black and provided the gear like a tactical vest. I was nervous, but the pay was too good to say no. As I drove to the club, I thought about what might happen there. I'd watched videos of security guards dealing with drunk people, and it seemed hard but I focused on getting paid. When I got there, Danny told us what to do. He was really energetic, maybe too much, but I didn't mind. My job was to check IDs and watch the crowd. Lots of people came in at the start. As time went on, I got more nervous. My legs hurt from sitting for so long, and I was hungry because I hadn't eaten dinner. But I kept watching, and only stepped in once when a guy was bothering a girl. At 2 a.m., Danny gave me some drinks at the bar. I had one, and then it became morning suddenly, and everyone was gone. I found Danny sleeping and realized something was wrong. Later, I found out he had put bad stuff in my drinks and was bringing women into the club against their will. I was shocked. I found out a scary secret, and I knew I had to leave Las Vegas. The club got closed down, but I left without waiting for updates. Las Vegas can be dangerous especially if you upset the wrong people. I regret taking that job, but I didn't have a choice. Now, I'm just happy to be far away from that bad experience. But that's not the end. Some months later, I got a strange package in the mail. It had a small thing called a flash drive inside with the word evidence on it. I wasn't sure what to do at first, but I got really curious and decided to put it in my computer. What I saw on it shocked me a lot. 
It showed a video from the nightclub where Danny and his friends were doing bad things. But then, I noticed something weird in the background of one video. It was someone I knew, the owner of the nightclub who was supposed to be in Italy. But there he was, behind everything that was happening, making it all happen. I couldn't believe it. The boss was involved, too. It seemed like the bad stuff was even worse than I thought. I knew I had to do something, but I didn't know who to trust. I talked to a friend who works in law enforcement, hoping they could help me understand what was happening. But before we could meet, I got another package in the mail. This time, it was a letter, written by someone who had been forced to work in the nightclub. She thanked me for speaking up and asked for my help to stop the people who were hurting them. Her words made me feel like I had a reason to do something important. I couldn't ignore what was going on. I had to do something, even if it was risky. I had proof on a flash drive and a letter from someone who survived. I took them to the police and told them everything. I talked about my job at the nightclub and the videos I found. At first, they didn't believe me much, but when I showed them more proof, they started to believe me. We worked together to check out the nightclub and the people who owned it. It was hard, and sometimes I was scared for myself, but in the end all the work we did was worth it. The nightclub got closed forever and Danny and the owner got arrested because they were doing bad things like human trafficking and being corrupt. I felt happy that justice happened, but also sad. I kept thinking if I had paid more attention, maybe I could have stopped it earlier. When I thought about all that happened, I learned that even surprising changes can bring good things. In this situation, it helped make things fair for people who were treated badly. I left Las Vegas feeling good because I helped make the city safer. Even though I saw scary things, I'll also remember how brave people were in standing up to them. Me and my friends started making music on weekends, just for fun. We got better and even made some money. We decided to live together to make things easier. There were four of us. We all had our own lives during the week, but on weekends we made music together. We put our music on YouTube and Spotify. As we made more money, we wanted to rent a bigger place. Two of us still live with our parents, but the other two already shared a house. Their place wasn't big enough for all of us, and their landlord didn't want more people. We thought about sneaking in, but it was too risky. We didn't want our friends to lose their home. It took a long time to find a place to live. We had a certain amount of money to spend, but it was hard to find a place that was affordable and in a good area, and big enough for our music stuff. After looking for weeks, we realized we needed to spend more money than we planned. We didn't really want to, but we didn't have a choice. The places we could afford were either too far away or not in good condition. Also, landlords didn't like it when we wanted to test the internet before renting, because they thought we were doing something wrong. Finally, we found a place on Craigslist. It had five bedrooms and wasn't much more expensive than the ones we had seen before. We all got into my friend's truck and drove there. It was a bit far from the main part of town, but it was closer to where some of my friends lived. It took about 20 minutes to drive there from my place. When we got there, there was a big gate blocking the way. We had to call the person from Craigslist to open it for us. When he came, one of his dogs came too. It was big and looked mean, barking a lot. We felt scared, but the guy opened the gate and let us in. The dog kept barking while we parked. It seemed like it wanted to hurt us. We were scared to get out of the car, but we needed to see the house. It looked nice in the pictures, big and newly fixed up, when we got out, the dog went crazy and bit my friend Elliot's leg. It was really scary. The owner tried to stop it, and Elliot was in a lot of pain. Eventually, the guy used something to shock the dog and make it let go, but Elliot got hurt badly. We called for help because the dog hurt Elliot really badly. The police came and took care of the dog. Elliot had to go to the hospital and have an operation. It was scary, but luckily the doctors were able to save his leg. He still has scars, and it's hard for him sometimes. We told the police about what happened, and the owner of the dog got in trouble. They took the dog away. We decided not to live in that place anymore because of what happened. It was a really bad experience, and now I'm scared of dogs that might be mean, and people who don't take care of them. Even though it was really hard, we didn't give up on our dream of living together and making music. We kept looking for a new place, but we were more careful this time. After looking for a while, we found a nice old house in a quiet area. It cost a bit more than we planned, but we liked it a lot. The owner, Mrs. Jenkins, was very kind and showed us around. 
The house had enough space for our music stuff, and the neighborhood was calm, unlike the busy place we saw before. We knew this was the right place for us. We signed papers with Mrs. Jenkins and quickly moved in. It felt like a new beginning, and we were happy to live together and concentrate on our music with no interruptions. When we got used to our new home we spent a lot of time playing music and recording songs in our DIY studio. It felt really exciting, and we felt super creative. We were making the best music we ever had, putting all our feelings into each song. But then something weird happened. One night, while we were recording, we heard a strange sound from upstairs. It sounded like someone walking slowly and carefully in the quiet hallway. We stopped our music and looked at each other nervously. We hadn't gone upstairs since we moved in because Mrs. Jenkins said it was only for storing things and she rarely went up there. But we got curious and decided to check it out. We took flashlights from the kitchen and went up the creaky stairs. Our footsteps mixed with some other strange ones from upstairs. When we got to the top, the strange footsteps stopped suddenly. We stood quietly, shining our flashlights around, but we couldn't see anything or anyone. We thought we were just imagining things, but then we heard a quiet voice asking for help. It was so quiet we could barely hear it. I felt scared and got goosebumps all over my body. My friends looked scared too. Without saying anything, we quickly ran downstairs and locked ourselves in the living room. We were too scared to even talk. For a long time, we stayed close together, listening hard for any more weird sounds. But the house stayed very quiet. We got really tired and eventually fell asleep, feeling uneasy. The next day, we tried to make sense of what happened. Maybe we imagined it all, or perhaps the old house was just making strange noises because it's old. But inside, we couldn't ignore the feeling that something was wrong. The whisper we heard seemed too real, too scary to ignore. As time went on, we tried to go about our lives, but what happened kept bothering us. We avoided going upstairs, scared of what might happen if we did. One night, while getting ready to make a new song, we heard weird sounds again. They were louder this time, like something upstairs was trying to talk to us. We got scared and looked at each other nervously. We couldn't pretend it wasn't happening. So we gathered our bravery and went upstairs again to find out what was making the noise. As we went upstairs, we heard more and more quiet talking. We followed the noise and found a door we hadn't seen before. It felt creepy, like it was hiding something scary. I was scared, but I reached out and opened the door slowly. It creaked loudly as it swung open, revealing a dusty attic. Inside, there was an old chest covered in cobwebs. We were curious, so we opened it carefully. Inside, we found lots of old things, like pictures, letters, and other stuff from a long time ago. We found an old diary in the house that really got us interested. Its pages were old and yellow. As we read it, we learned it belonged to a young woman who used to live here. She had a sad story. The diary said she was a talented musician like us, but one night, she fell down the stairs and hurt herself badly. She broke her neck and couldn't move her legs anymore. She was really sad and couldn't handle it anymore, so she ended her own life. It made us feel very sad too when we read what she wrote. We understood that the strange sounds we heard were her trying to tell us something, but we didn't realize it at first. We wanted to do something nice for her, so we made a song in memory of her. We wanted to show how talented she was and how sad it was that she died. When we played the song it felt like she was finally at peace, like our music helped her find peace. Since that day, the strange sound stopped and the house felt happier, like a big problem was solved. We kept playing music together, but now we understood how music can make us feel better and bring us closer together. When we think about that crazy time, we see that surprises can teach us new things and show us secrets we didn't know. Life is full of mysteries, and even though it can be scary, it's also exciting and meaningful if we're brave enough to explore it. When I was 15, something really scary happened to me and my family. It all started when my little sister Lily got very sick. She was only 11 years old when the doctor said she had something called lymphoma, which is a type of cancer. It was really scary for all of us. Even though mom and dad tried to stay strong, I could tell they were really worried. After a few months, the doctors said Lily's cancer had spread all over her body and there wasn't much time left. Mom and Dad decided to take her out of school so we could spend as much time together as possible. They both had to work, but they tried to be with her as much as they could. We lived in a house that we were still paying for, but it wasn't near the beach, and Lily really liked the beach. 
So mom had an idea to move us closer to the coast. She went on a website called Craigslist and found a way to swap houses with someone who lived near the beach. It was a bit scary because we'd never done that before. But mom said we should enjoy the time we had left with Lily. We met a man named Paul who owned the house we were going to stay in. He seemed friendly and he mentioned having family in our state. So it worked out for him too. Mom told him about Lily's condition and he said he was okay with it. When we went to Paul's house, everything seemed okay at first, but then mom had trouble with the pipes in the house. She tried to call Paul for help, but he didn't answer. She even tried calling his phone, but it kept hanging up by itself. It was strange. Then one night while I was asleep, mom found Paul hiding in a closet in one of the rooms. I woke up to her screaming, and I got really scared. We called the police, and they told us that Paul had been secretly watching us the whole time. It felt like something you'd see in a scary movie. We had to leave Paul's house and find another place to stay. Mom told people that there was a burglar, but I knew the real reason. It was the scariest thing that ever happened to us, and sometimes I still have bad dreams about it. The worst part was seeing how scared Lily was. She didn't understand what was happening, and it made me very sad to see her so frightened. Later, we found another place to stay, but things were never quite the same. I'm just happy that we're all okay now, but I'll always remember how scary that night was. It taught me that you can't always trust people, even if they seem nice. As time went on, Lily started to feel a little better. She was still sick, but she wasn't getting worse as quickly. Mom and Dad were relieved, but they were still very worried about her. One day, Mom got a phone call from a faraway family member. They heard about Lily being sick and wanted to help. They said we could stay in their beach house for a while, so Lily could feel better by the sea. Mom wasn't sure at first, but she said yes in the end. We packed our things and went to the beach house, hoping it would be good for Lily. When we got there, we saw how pretty the beach house was. It was right by the ocean and had an amazing view. Lily was so happy when she saw it. I knew we did the right thing. We went to a beach house to relax. Mom and Dad looked after Lily, my sister. I tried to keep her happy. We played in the sand and water and enjoyed the sun. One evening, while watching the sunset on the porch, we heard crying from the beach. We went to see what was happening. There we found a girl named Emily, crying alone on the sand. Mom went to talk to her. Emily told us she was alone at a beach house because her family had gone out. She felt scared being by herself, especially at night. My mom felt bad for her and asked her to stay with us until her family returned. Emily was thankful, and she felt happier once she was with us. Later, we sat around a fire toasting marshmallows and telling stories. Emily got along well with us, and Lily was excited to have a new friend to play with. When it got dark, things got scary. We heard strange sounds from the beach, like someone walking. Mom and Dad went to see, but they didn't find anyone. We all felt scared. Lily started crying. Mom tried to help, but she was scared too. I held Lily tight and stayed calm. Then, a scary man appeared. He was tall and looked mean. Mom screamed, and Dad tried to protect us. Before we could do anything, Emily went up to the man and told him to leave us alone. She said he should go away. After a moment, he left. We were scared, but Emily wasn't. She said not to worry. The next day, Emily was missing. We looked everywhere for her, but she was gone. We never knew who Emily was or where she came from, but she helped us when we needed it most. We were thankful for her, even though we didn't know her. That scary night at the beach will always stick in our minds. Lily got better, and we went back home safely. But we'll never forget that night. It taught us that even when things seem scary, good things can happen unexpectedly. I'm only 15 years old, and my life is pretty simple. I'm just trying to earn some money whenever I can. One day... I was browsing through ads on a website called Craigslist, looking for small jobs. I found one about walking dogs in my neighborhood. 
It seems like some people in Jacksonville need help because they live on a farm and can't walk their dogs in the morning and evening. I thought, why not give it a try? There's this guy named Patrick in the ad. I tried calling him, but he didn't pick up. So, I sent him a text and waited a few days for him to reply. Turns out, lots of other people were also applying. But I figured, if it pays well, why not give it a shot? Patrick wants to see how dogs react to us, so he asked us to meet at the farm. I agreed and drove there. It took me about 20 minutes from my house. When I arrived, it felt like I was in a movie. There were big, empty fields and trees everywhere. Patrick told me to drive down a long lane, turn left past an old horse barn, and there I was, at the farm. I went to Patrick's house and knocked on the door. Patrick opened it, and behind him was a small dog named Betsy. Betsy was really cute and kept jumping around and barking. Patrick and his family were friendly. They asked me some questions about taking care of dogs and wrote down my information for a background check. To make it short, I got the job. Patrick told me I would start working in two weeks. Betsy had a tough time before because she was rescued from a bad situation, so they needed someone to walk her and make sure she didn't run away. Two weeks later, I went back to Patrick's house to take Betsy for a walk. Patrick tells me to go left on the dirt path by the farm. It's a two-mile circle. Good for walking, Betsy. At first, walks are fine. But when winter comes, it gets dark sooner. I don't like walking in the dark much, but it's part of my job. One night, things get bad. We're on our usual walk when I hear noises from the forest. Betsy stops and listens. I think it's animals, but then I see three people in black robes in the forest. I got really scared. Betsy, my dog, started pulling on her leash and someone started coming towards us. I got so scared that I started running, pulling Betsy with me. I slipped and fell, but I got back up and kept running. I didn't even realize I had left Betsy behind until it was too late. I ran back to the car, feeling really scared. I told my friend Patrick what happened and he got a gun, ready to go find the person. We looked around, but all we saw were their footprints. Betsy was gone. After that, I stopped walking dogs. I was too scared to think about what might have happened. But sometimes I wish I never let Betsy go, but I guess it's good because it kept me safe in the end. As I was walking Betsy, everything was going well like usual. Betsy was happy to see me, and we had our routine. But one evening... Something strange happened. While we were walking, I saw someone ahead. At first, I thought it might be a worker from the farm or a neighbor. But as we got closer, I realized it was someone I didn't know. This person was standing beside the path wearing all black. It was getting dark, so I couldn't see their face clearly. My heart started beating fast because it felt a bit scary. I stopped because I didn't know what to do. Should I go back and find a different way? Or should I continue and hope everything is okay? Then my dog Betsy started growling. This was unusual because she's normally very nice. But now she seemed worried. Like she sensed something bad. When I looked up, I saw someone holding something that looked like a flashlight. But it was flickering strangely, making spooky shadows in the dark. I felt scared and decided to go back home another way. But when I tried to leave, someone appeared in front of us blocking the path. I got really scared and didn't know what to do. I looked at the stranger, trying to figure out what they wanted. Who are you? I asked nervously, barely able to speak. The person didn't say anything. They just came closer, moving slowly. I quickly grabbed my phone, ready to call for help if things got worse. But as I struggled with it, I suddenly felt really scared. Suddenly, the person jumped forward grabbing Betsy's leash and pulling her away from me. I yelled in surprise, trying hard to stop them, but I couldn't stop them. The person was too strong. Suddenly, they vanished into the dark, taking Betsy with them. I felt shocked and all by myself. What happened? Why did they take Betsy? As I tried to understand, I heard footsteps. Patrick, the farm owner, came running towards me, looking worried. What happened? He asked, sounding worried. I tried to tell him what happened, but I was so scared and confused that my words didn't make much sense. Patrick listened closely, 
looking more and more serious. We have to find her. Come on, let's go. He said firmly, looking determined. So we went together into the dark forest trying to find Betsy. But as we walked deeper, I felt like someone was watching us. Every sound made me jump, but Patrick stayed calm and kept going, leading the way. After looking for a long time, we found a clear space in the forest. Betsy, our pet, was hiding behind a tree, scared and making soft cries. I felt really happy when I picked her up. She was scared, but not hurt. When I looked at Patrick to thank him, he seemed worried. His eyes were moving around nervously, like he was looking for something. What's wrong? I asked, feeling scared again. But before Patrick could answer, we heard footsteps coming from behind us, and it made us stop and listen carefully. Patrick looked serious when he heard the loud footsteps. We turned around slowly because we were scared. Three people in dark clothes came out of the shadows. We couldn't see their faces well because it was dark. Who are you? Patrick asked loudly. His voice echoed in the quiet. People didn't say anything. It felt spooky with them there. I held onto Betsy tightly, wanting to protect her. Suddenly, the person in the middle moved forward. They looked very intentional and made me feel uneasy. They spoke quietly, giving me chills. We're not here to hurt you. We just want advice from the wise ones who live in these woods. They said mysteriously. Patrick got serious, sensing danger. What do you need from us? He asked confidently, though he was scared. The figures looked at each other, before the one in the middle talked again. We want to go through the special part of this forest. We want to talk to the spirits who live here. I looked at Patrick with worry. The situation felt strange, like something from a scary story. But I knew, deep down, we shouldn't trust these people. We can't let you go through. These woods are dangerous. It's better if you go back. Patrick said firmly. The people seemed unsure for a moment, but then they disappeared into the forest without saying anything, leaving us in silence. Patrick felt very tired and relieved. He said we should go back because it wasn't safe to stay. I agreed, feeling scared from what happened. We walked back to the farm, but I still felt like something bad might happen. I promised myself I'd do anything to keep Betsy safe, even if it's hard. I used to live with my friend Jake in a small house when we were in college. Jake was my roommate in the first year of college. Then, we decided to live together in a house, because we both had jobs that paid enough money. Renting the house was new for us, so we didn't know how to manage our money well. After a few months, everything seemed okay, but almost a year later, we realized that paying rent was using up all our money. So, we had to do something about it. We had two options either move out or find someone else to help pay the rent with us. But neither of us wanted to move, so we had to find another person to share the rent with us. We asked our friends if they wanted to move in with us, but none of them were interested. So we had to put up ads online. I posted one on Facebook Marketplace, and Jake posted one on Craigslist. It felt strange because we've never done this before, but we didn't have many options. A few weeks went by, and we only got a few responses, but none of them were serious about moving in. Then Jake showed me an email from someone named Max, who responded to his Craigslist ad. Max seemed okay, a bit older than us, just graduated, but he seemed clean and decent, so we decided to give it a try. He said he'd share the rent, and moved in a week later. At first, Max hung out with us a lot, and we got to know him. But then, suddenly, he started spending a lot of time alone. Max hardly talked to Jake and me. He stayed in his room with the door closed most of the time, only coming out for food or work. It was strange, but I didn't mind much at first. After about four months, things got weirder. When I came home from work, Jake warned me to be quiet because Max was home. He also mentioned a bad smell near Max's room. I didn't smell it at first, but when Jake pointed it out, I noticed it too. It was really gross, and I didn't know what it was because I hadn't smelled it in the house before. Jake said we should ask Max about something, so we went to Max's door, knocked, and called for him, but he didn't say anything. 
Jake thought he was inside, but we stopped trying after some time and decided to ask him later. The next day, I saw Max leaving and asked him about the bad smell. He said he was throwing out the garbage and left quickly. I didn't understand it well, but I didn't ask more questions. A couple of weeks passed. Max didn't talk much to us, but the bad smell disappeared. One night, I heard some noise from downstairs, where Max's room was. I tried to see what he was doing, but I fell asleep again. The next day, Max went to work like usual, but he didn't come back home that night. Days passed and he still didn't return. We tried calling him, but his phone was off. We started to get worried and checked his room. Some of his things were gone, but his clothes and furniture were still there. We found glasses in his drawer, which was strange because Max didn't wear glasses. We called the police to tell them Max was missing. An officer came, and we explained everything, showing him a picture we had taken with Max when he first moved in. A week later, a different detective called us. They said the person in the photo wasn't Max. It was someone else who'd been missing for almost a year. The situation got confusing, and we couldn't keep in touch anymore. The person never returned, and we never learned the truth. It's scary to realize I lived with someone who lied about themselves and vanished without a clue. I wonder what secrets they were hiding. Later, Jake and I tried to forget about the strange time with Max. We found a new roommate named Kyle, who was really chill and friendly. Everything was getting back to normal until one day. We got a letter from Max. I found something in the mailbox and was shocked to see Max's name on it. I quickly went inside to show Jake and we were both surprised. Why was Max sending us mail after so long? We talked about whether we should open it or not, but we couldn't resist our curiosity. Inside was a paper with a note written by hand. Dear Jake and Alex, I hope you're both doing well. I need to say sorry for disappearing suddenly. I didn't mean to worry you. The truth is, I didn't tell you everything about me. My real name is Sam. I had to leave quickly because of some personal problems. I had to start fresh with a new name, but I didn't want to lie to you. I know you might have questions. If you want to talk, I'll be at the old warehouse on Elm Street tomorrow at noon. Just you, please. We can talk things out. Jake and I looked worried when we read the letter. It was surprising and made us more curious about Max. Or Sam. We really wanted answers, but we felt nervous too. Still. We decided to meet Sam the next day. We went together to be safe, but we were careful. The place where we met, an old warehouse, was scary. It had broken windows and walls covered in graffiti. I started to feel really scared. What if this was a trick? We went into the dark room carefully, calling for Sam, but nobody answered. Just when we were going to leave, we heard footsteps coming closer from the dark corners. Then. A person came out from the darkness. It was Sam, but he looked different, tired, and not like himself. Jake, Alex, I'm glad you're here, he said, sounding both relieved and sad. What happened to you, Sam? Jake asked, worried. Sam took a moment before replying with a heavy sigh. I don't even know where to start. It's been really hard. He said he was living with a fake name because he was scared of some bad guys from his past. He didn't want to tell us everything, but he mentioned some dangerous stuff he did before. He thought he could have a new beginning here, but now he feels bad because his old problems came back. Sam said, looking sad. We listened carefully as he talked about his hard times and how scared he was of being found out. It was a bit shocking but it helped us understand why he acted so quiet and secretive around us. Sorry for lying, guys. I had to. I get it if you're mad. Sam said, sounding sad. Jake and I felt bad for Sam. He seemed really sorry. Even though he messed up, we couldn't just leave him alone. We don't know you well, Sam, I told him. But we'll give you another chance. Sam seemed happier and nodded to say thank you. Thanks to both of you. You don't know how much this helps me. When we left the warehouse, I felt like things were settled. Our meeting with Sam turned out different than I expected, but it made us feel closer. Even though I didn't know much about Sam's past, I was glad to be part of his journey to make things right.
I remember when I got my new wrist gadget. It was an Apple Watch. So cool and new. I was really happy and thought it would make a big difference in my life. But I didn't end up using it much. So I decided to sell it on a website called Craigslist. I took some pictures of the watch, like the front, back, and all the bands. Then I put up my ad. People started responding right away, but I thought it would be fair to reply to them in the order they messaged me. Once there was a man who said he was in the army. He wanted to buy a watch as a gift for his cousin's graduation. I thought that was thoughtful. So I chose him. He needed the watch quickly for a party on the weekend. He asked if I could send it the next day and he'd give me extra money to cover the fast shipping. I thought it sounded like a good idea, so I agreed. I got a paper from PayPal and quickly went to the post office. I sent it and told him the code to track it, but then I felt something wasn't right. Usually when someone sends me money on PayPal, my bank tells me with an email. But this time, I got nothing. I looked at the paper again. Some things didn't match up. I should have checked his address to be sure it was real, but I was in a hurry. I trusted his story about needing the money fast for a graduation party. But when I looked again, the address seemed strange. And there were other signs that the PayPal money might not be real. I felt dumb. I always told people to be careful of tricks. And there I was, tricked. So I went to the nearby police office to tell them what happened. They said because I lived in an area that's not officially part of a city. I had to talk to the sheriff's office instead. Sounded scary, but they were really nice and helpful. They even sent someone to meet me at the police office. I told them everything. The advertisement, the person pretending to be in the military, the gift for graduation, everything. But without the special number on the item, they couldn't do much. Then I remembered I had pictures of everything. Even though I got tricked, at least I was a smart victim of the trick. The police officer wrote down the number and where I sent the watch. He said he talked to the local police there. I said thank you and left, feeling embarrassed. I had to tell my boyfriend, friends, and parents what happened. Two days later, the officer called me. The police in that town got a paper to search the house where I sent the watch. And guess what? They found not just my watch, but lots of them, worth thousands of dollars. They also found other expensive things like gadgets. The person there was helping her fiancé in Nigeria get all of this stuff. She said he was good, but the police didn't believe her. They stopped a big cheating plan. It was a trick that was fooling lots of people everywhere. But I told someone about it, so they caught the cheaters and got back what they took from others. A little while after, I got a call saying my watch was fixed. But guess what? I had to go to a scary place that looked like a jail. I had to go through a security check and say why I came. Then they gave me back my watch, just like I sent it, all wrapped up. Every day, I always wear my watch. But I won't use Craigslist to buy or sell things again. Something surprising happened later. I got a package in the mail a few weeks after. It was for me, but I didn't buy anything. I opened it and found another Apple Watch, just like the one I sold. At first, I thought it was a mistake. Maybe the person who tricked me felt bad and sent it back. Then I found a note inside the box. Hi. I hope you're doing great. Remember the watch that got lost? Well, I wanted to fix that. Here's a new one. A gift from someone who thinks good deeds come back around. Take care. Your secret friend. I was surprised. Who would be so kind? I thought hard but couldn't remember telling anyone outside my close friends about the lost watch. It was a nice mystery though. I felt amazed and thankful when I put on my new watch. It reminded me that there are nice people around. Even though there are also bad ones who trick others. It made me think differently about life. Instead of always worrying about getting tricked. Maybe I should focus on being open to kind surprises. As time went by. I couldn't stop thinking that there was more to the story of my new watch. Who gave it to me secretly? And why did they help me? I thought about trying to find them, but I decided to leave it alone. Some mysteries are better not solved. Instead, I decided to help others. I gave some money to a charity nearby and helped out at a shelter for homeless people. It wasn't a lot, but it was my way of being nice in a world that can seem sad sometimes. As for Craigslist, 
Well, I won't use it again. I've learned my lesson. I'll stick to buying and selling things in person, or through safer places. It might be a bit harder, but at least I won't get tricked. In the end, everything I went through taught me an important lesson about trust, being nice to others, and how life can change in surprising ways. Life has lots of unexpected moments. Some are nice, and some are not so nice. But what really counts is how we deal with them. As for me, I've decided to be thankful, stay positive, and believe in people again.